They would start with Bernie Rubber in the middle of the street and doing wheaties. Got a little drunk, and pretty soon they're racing down the main drag here. And then when they try to stop them, they couldn't. They drove a bike through the bar, and then into the lobby, then out. A guy came in with his bike and started spinning a circle right on the rug. We all stood up on the bar. When they hit town, it was something, I think, that appalled all of us. Bunch of crap, far as I'm concerned. I'm a lifelong resident of Hollister, California. Lived here all my life. Moved up here in 1937, 35, 36. Born and raised in Hollister, 1938, third generation. I came in Hollister in 1942. Well, I've been here 61 years. There used to be a lot of work here at one time, fuel work and uh, canneries, and uh, people just started coming. My grandfather came from Portugal and, of course, resided here in about 1894. It was primarily agricultural in apricots, orchard, and all. That's what the basis of our whole economy was always based on. Well, it was nice and peaceful then. <laughs> you know, we were farmers, you know, we, uh, we raised prunes and stuff. It's grown quite a bit but it was uh, relatively small in the early days. How's it changed? Uh, modern stuff has come in, you know. Storefront change, people change. We had new people in here, but it's still a good, as far as I'm concerned, it's still a good, healthy community. Alster's a relief of the hustle and bustle of everyday life. People, they're nine to fivers, basically, and they, they just want to get back to, to something that they, they see in their mind is uh, used to be. It's rural, it's off the beaten track. It will be maintained to a certain degree, the old flavor of Hollister, it's still there. The breeze is usually nice. We have green rolling hills to look at, uh, the air quality is good, and it's usually quiet. And that's what's kind of unique about Hollister. It's, uh, it has the quiet before the storm type. Uh, feel. I'm Jess, Jess Bravo. Joe, Joe, Joe Bravo. Bravo. My name is Marcelo. My nickname is Shorty. I'm Vice President for Top Hatters, Hollister, California. My brother. brother. Younger. He's younger than I am. <laughs> Couple of years. Uh, my name's Carl Spots. I'm Road name is Big Daddy. I'm the International Vice President of the Booze Fighters Motorcycle Club. My name is Jim Quattlebaum. My road name is JQ History, and I'm the National Historian with the Booze Fighters Motorcycle Club. My name is Snowman. I'm from San Diego, California. Um, I'm a charter holder of the San Diego Charter, which is the oldest charter on the West Coast. I'm Kiko. I'm President of the Top Hatters, Hollister, California. I'm Bill Hayes. I'm the uh, National Press and Publicity Officer for the Booze Fighters Motorcycle Club. And when you look at the history of clubs, you, you go way back, and, and there were riding clubs way back before the, the World War II days. Hollister had always been kind of a motorcycling mecca, if you will, and I think it was uh, due to the popularity of the previous pre-war races and that they had there. That being in the early 30s, it was always this recreation activity of these people getting together with their motorcycles. One of the big events that really evolved was the motorcycle gypsy tour was held in 1936 at Bellotto Park. There'd be all these different uh, clubs like the Top Hatters possibly or the, you know, the Booze Fighters, things like this, but they were really, they were here to race. From all over the, they'd ride their bikes down here and race, take the headlight off race, and the Gypsy Tour was a, was a circuit. So it was very popular. And then uh, when the war started, then they quit. Uh, the Gypsy Tour, which was sponsored by the AMA, used to be a, a circuit of races that went from city to city, town to town, and bef that was prior to World War II. After the war started, well, they had to cut it out. But it really wasn't until after World War II that the motorcycle clubs, at least the, the genesis of them, began. The Black Rebels were patterned after what 
really was there in Hollister in 47. You had us, the Boost Fighters, you had the Top Hatters. At that time, it was becoming very different. They weren't riding clubs. They were beginning to become more of that camaraderie that was developed in the trenches of World War II. After the war, the community thought so much about it, they built Veterans Memorial Park, they built a raceway. And they had races there once a year. On the July 4th, the Gypsy Tour would come to town, and, and they had the races during the day. In the evening, you, you drink a little beer and let their hair down. Uh, one of the major people that participated in that was Johnny Lomano. I'm one of the original top hatters that started, you know. There's, there was about, oh, maybe 30 of us, you know, that started the club and the, we started having events and stuff. I think I started the top hatters. I was clowning around with a top hat and, and the derby or something like that, and I think that's what started the top hatters. And that was in 46. Uh, the booze fighters started in 46, so they, that's when the booze fighters started becoming a part of uh, the Gypsy Tour rallies. Yeah, I got out of the Army, started racing. I became a scrambler, which is a motorcycle club in Southern California. And when I moved to Northern California, there wasn't any clubs up there I wanted to be part of. And I started working with Huck, who's the president of Chapter 5 in Hollister and I've wanted to be a booze fighter ever since. It was founded by Wino Willie Forkner and uh, a bunch of his buddies. Willie was a classic, an absolute classic. <laughs> the thing that sticks out in my mind was uh, sitting at Huck's house, and uh, we were sitting at a picnic table in Huck's backyard. He's the president up in Hollister, and Willie's sitting at the, at the picnic table with a, with a cocktail, and, and uh, that house that Huck lives in just happens to have been the police chief Earl's house during the so-called Hollister incident. You know? And uh, Willie sat there kind of shaking his head and he says, he says, that guy would be spinning this his grave if he knew I was partying in his backyard, you know? And that's probably one of the best quotes I can ever come up with about Willie. Why do Willie Forkner is one of the most interesting characters in all of motorcycle history? Uh, an incredibly charismatic man, and uh, again, a World War II vet like all the original uh, bikers were. They were disaffiliate, dissatisfied. They didn't want to settle into whatever was normal, typical life at the time. They got on motorcycles, and they loved it, and they took to the roads. And the idea of the edginess of motorcycles, motorcycle racing, drinking, the camaraderie, the com type of camaraderie that they'd had in the trenches of war, all that fit. The guys were restless. They were familiar with riding motorcycles in Europe, and they needed to burn off some of that stress from the war and the motorcycle clubs, and that was kind of new to America, but it really took off at that time. The booze fighters started out, they certainly were into racing. Uh, I mean, that was the uh, way they released their adrenaline from coming back from World War II. And as a matter of fact, uh, one of the problems that they had was the, the AMA uh, about their name. Uh, but they did get enter races. They basically had to resort to what you call uh, outlaw races, which meant outside the rules of the AMA. The AMA decided to recrank up the Gypsy Tour races. The first event they had was scheduled for Hollister, California, July 4th weekend, 1947. They started having races and fun stuff like that. And you know, when you get that many people together, there's gonna to be a few things that are gonna be bad. You know, they would start with burning rubber in the middle of the street and doing wheelies and things of that nature. And then, it, you know, it just got out of hand in 47. A lot happened that didn't have to. And it wasn't our bunch. It was called the Raid or Invasion of Motorcycles because it was a time when just after the conclusion of the war and there was nobody that was conceived as an outlaw. The headlines of the paper were, you know, you know, 4,000 bikers take over a town of 3,000 or whatever the numbers were, you know, and it was, I think it was pretty much overstated, but I think the police just kind of let them have their fun. The police were not used to this overindulgence. You know, there was people drinking, you know, and they were all having a good time, and 
I was in the middle of it too. I was there. We raced a little bit up and down the street and stuff, but then the highway patrol come in and took care of that, and it's all stopped. They didn't have too many, many police at the time, and they left the riders start playing around. They get started drinking, got a little drunk, and pretty soon they're racing down the main drag here. And then when they try to stop them, they couldn't. There was a few fights and stuff, and guys went to jail and stuff like that. That weekend, in 47, you had almost 5,000 motorcyclists that invaded uh, the community. You know, they pulled into this small town. There was nothing there. And when you uh, get a bunch of guys together and they get a little rowdy, and I think you throw in alcohol, it uh, changes the whole atmosphere. And when the cat's away, the mice will play type deal. You know, I think about a dozen people ended up in jail, or maybe 20 or 25 people, just for normal things. The ticker tape went out that yeah, there's a couple of reporters happened to be in the area, either covering the race or just here, took pictures and say, oh, they're taking over the town. You know, and that's what went out to. By the time, you know, a day and a half later, it reaches San Francisco or something, you know, that the town was taken over. But I think it was a little bit dramified. They rode a bike in the bar once or, once or twice during the event. So they, they drove a bike through the bar, and then into the lobby, then out. <laughs> so we had less damage or something to clean up after motorcycle than we used to do sometime after local uh, Saturday's night. You know, they, I mean, they were wonderful. Of course, we were nice to them, and they were nice to us. And as, you know, as years go on, uh, stories can uh, grow. Your fish that you caught here is now this fish, and um, it may have been uh, fabricated a little bit. They figured they were uh, a bunch of bad people. There was nothing as bad as what the, the wild one come out with. I know that uh, Frank Rooney wrote a novel for Harper's Magazine called A Cyclist Raid. Uh, in the, that was in 1951. In uh, the San Francisco Chronicle, I don't recall that it was called A Cyclist Raid, but it uh, had to do with a riot, supposedly, that took place in Hollister during that July 4th, 47 weekend. It was a photo op by a guy from the San Francisco Chronicle. Actually, he was a freelancer, I believe, and he would sell his uh, stories to the San Francisco Chronicle. I think after World War II was over, people were, uh, uh, you know, they used to get a lot of war news and what have you. Well, uh, they needed something to uh, kind of spark the attention of the general public to buy their magazines. And in turn, that was a catchy uh, type picture and a brief little story that they put with it really caught people's imagination of something horrific going on in a little sleepy town in California. Well, that, when I got here, the Life Magazine photo was already part of the bar. So uh, that, luckily, came with the bar. And that was a very important part of history, and I'm really glad I have it. Oh, the one in front of the bar. I, I don't even think that guy was a biker. No, it was just a put-up job, that one there. Yeah, so they threw cans around the bike to make it look beer, real. Beer bottles and all that. They did a pretty good job, though. Mm -hmm. That photograph, there was a gentleman standing in the back that was um, Gus de Serpa. And that's me. Well, this is, a, this is a bunch of malarkey. All these beer bottles and Coke bottles and whatever it is right there, they were placed there to make it look like they were drinking all they could drink, and it, it, there's nothing like that at all. No. Well, there's lots of speculation on that photograph and, and who the individual was. And um, the one that I've probably heard the most, and I'm not saying that it's the correct one, but that gentleman was a Tuluri Raider. And then there's a lot of people say that uh, he wasn't a biker at all. But he's clearly wearing engineer boots, which is, to this day, what we wear. You need good shoes when you ride a motorcycle. He wanted to make us look like a bunch of drunks, and it didn't work that way. <laughs> it was done right here, and uh, I don't know how many different photographers or how many pictures they took, but this one photographer picked up a bunch of beer bottles in the curb here put him around the bike, and then he took his picture. There's no doubt that it was staged merely by all the beer bottles under the guy's tires, you know? There might have been a few bottles, but they weren't like 
bottles like I seen in that picture stacked all over the place. I think that's the first thing that you question. How many bottles can there be under, if you're relating to one person, he couldn't have drink that much. But there was a lot of drinking and uh, hooping and hollering, but I don't think none of it to the degree that they said, because most of the, uh, the old timers around town say it wasn't quite that bad. They just made it up a little worse than what it was, you know. Oh, it was definitely staged. Uh, actually, as I understand it, they took two uh, photos. Uh, one of them was with the same guy sitting on a motorcycle with a motorcycle racing jacket or some with an emblem had wings on it. That was on his shoulder in the picture that they used for the San Francisco Chronicle. The other picture they took was without the jacket on the shoulder. And that one, since they didn't use it, I understand Life Magazine asked them if they could uh, have a picture and they let them use that one. You can knock the photo, question the photo, criticize the photo, but if that photo was not done, you, we wouldn't be here today. So as critical as you want to be, God bless that photo. Well, I can't speak for other clubs, but, but uh, bikers in general, uh, nobody likes negative anything. And, and uh, you get negative perceptions out there, whether from, from society or law enforcement or whatever, and nobody likes that. You know, it's too bad Hollister isn't known for their coffee, and 100,000 people come here every year to sip coffee. I always wanted to go there, and. Uh, about 1975 is my first trip there, and uh, you know I'm not sure what I expected, other than I want to get my picture took by the sign. On the weekends we had lots of motorcycle riders cruising through. Everybody just wants to see Johnny's. People from France, Germany, all over the place, that just have heard about Johnny, so they want to come here. And now people just stand there all year long taking their picture in front of Marlin. And it's really cool. Well, you know, Johnny's bar has been very good to the booze fighters. Um, over the years, and you know, I don't go to town without stopping there and having a beer before I go settle down somewhere. Well, the booze fighters are, are number one because, I mean, they're the ones that started the whole thing. Wino Willie and his booze fighters back in 47 were the ones that got the whole thing going. And in 1996, the year before the 50th anniversary, Wino Willie came out with some of his guys, and he was so excited to be back for the 50th. And he died like four days short of the rally, which was so sad. But the booze fighters, this is their home. And it was just a fitting place to put part of his ashes. So at the time, I think we just had him in a shot glass. We wanted to make him the little vial for him, which was, was better. And everybody, we just had a moment of silence. And his granddaughter made a great toast. And we toasted Wino Willie. And we decided his ashes need to be an important part of this bar. So I had a good cry. And I needed it at that point. So it worked out really well. <laughs> As a requirement in, uh, in our charter in San Diego, um, you have to go solo to Hollister, get a picture took in front of Wino's Ashes, and uh, go meet some of the guys up there. And it's an adventure for that individual that joins the club. Well, I think it's a real interesting uh, a series of events, uh, going from the actual event that was blown out of proportion by San Francisco Chronicle, and then in turn, Life Magazine picks up on it and they blow it out of proportion some more for not only just America, but throughout the world, actually. And then from that, this Frank Rooney decides, hey, that'll make a good uh, story. So he picks up on that and blows it out of proportion some more and makes this novel called A Cyclist Raid. And then Mr. Stanley Kramer decided this would make a good movie. Out here, what a screwball town. <laughs> I attended the release of that movie and saw it here at the Old State Theater down on San Benito Street. And it was just a humorous event because uh, all of the townspeople came out to see this portrayal of the wild one. There's been a lot of controversy on uh, how well it depicts the times. Uh, you know, somebody said it looked like they was going to jump into a Broadway play any minute, the way uh, some of the actors uh, was carrying on at the bar and what have you. Hey, that Mildred gives the craziest permanent. Marina, honey, let's dance. Oh, I've been tapped. <laughs> it was amazing the laughter that evolved because it was laughter that just couldn't believe what they were seeing on the old silver screen. I think, you know, I mean, they got some of the uh, gist of the flavor of the times. 
And uh, even though it became rather fictitious of the actual events, it did make for a good uh, read and a good movie. You know, I remember uh, like the movie when I was a kid, you know, sitting on the living room floor. And uh, my fa most favorite part of the movie is the beginning, when they're going down that country road. The last little scene there is back tire moves the cat just a little bit. And uh, that's my favorite part of the movie. And uh, I, uh, I, I really think that that put a little edge in my life to, to want to do that one of these days. And I've been doing it for 30 something years. There's, a, there's an incredible mystique around the entire biker culture. And we are at the forefront of that. All the originals that are left or have just recently passed, they all talk about this era in, in really a spirit of fun. And the idea that you had this powerful, if you will, motorcycle club that was comprised of people that really, really just were having fun. And people that came out of a terrible horror being World War II. What an incredible dichotomy. And, and, and it is a dichotomy to what's some of the things that go on now, the perception of motorcycle clubs, the perception of bikers. America is in love with outlaws, that's real clear, whether you're talking about the popularity of The Sopranos or any one of the past going all the way back outlaw films. But what's an outlaw? The outlaw mystique they were scared of, that riot was blown up, which it wasn't anything like that. They call it the birthplace of the American biker. I mean, if you're into that biking scene and stuff like that, it, it, everybody wants to come here just to check it out. It's like the Grand Canyon or something like that, you know? People want to go see a big hole in the wall. People want to come and see halls. Their halls aren't all that big. And it's not congested like in a, in a city, like a big city. You ask any biker in, in Highway 25 from um, this end, uh, um, north end to the south and down there King City. It's, it's a very beautiful road. It's lined with hills and trees and has the turns that uh, people that ride bikes um, enjoy being able to get on. You can't ask for a better riding area. I mean, it's just beautiful. Out 25 and, you know, Santa Cruz and Monterey are all less than an hour away. It gives them an opportunity to be a real biker and to get out and enjoy freedom, that, that ability to get out and, and do their own thing. They feel good when you're on them. They make the best noise in the world. And if you're very lucky, you're part of a community that you care about, who's caring about the same thing you are, which is the look, the feel, the ride of the motorcycle. Well, you have the brotherhood, and freedom is, is an intoxication, and, and uh, there's nothing more important, nothing. And the idea of being able to share that with like-minded people, you talk about an intoxicant, and that's the ultimate high. There's really good people that uh, ride motorcycles. They're not all a bunch of dirty, stinking motorcyclists. You look around, you talk to these people, they're all just super people. And we do a lot of charity work. And we work for the kids and the old people, and down and out and whatever. We try to help. You know, they give more money to charity than any other group of people in the United States right now. We enjoy helping out. We donate to the community. We do a lot of benefits. We do three scholarships a year to the uh, high schools here in town. And just for uh, having our runs and our raffles and stuff like that, we turn everything back into the community. Now we're working for the friends of the military to help the brothers and sisters that are coming back from the war in Iraq and Iran and wherever else they are to help them get settled. We do it because the fun of riding and our friendship and all that with the other people that ride with us. And we call it like an extension of a family. Okay, hot shots, the fun is over. Every one of you monkeys is down in my book, and every stick of damage around here will be paid for. You've got 10 minutes to clear out. The major event happened in downtown, and 47 was in downtown Hollister, and the reenactment, so to speak, of that event with the rally is in downtown Hollister. The rally didn't reactivate till uh, 1996. Ever since that resurgence, I'd been there virtually every year, enjoyed the heck out of it. That really is a great cross-section there because you have club people welcomed, you have new people, older people, a great cross-section. I've documented these events every year that since uh, 1997, and I have met people from Australia, from England, from Germany, 
all over the United States that have attended this function, unfortunately, they do not have racing. They used to have racing. It was such that in 1996 and 97, David Grimsley was trying to put back the old gypsy tour. I built a drag strip when we raced out there and we had hill climbs and we brought hill climbers from Europe. In 1996, when they had the preliminary one, it was a whole different attitude or thing. The merchants, some of the merchants at that time were gonna board their businesses up. I mean, literally uh, ply board, plywood there because of the, there might be a riot, there might be windows broken and everything of that nature. A lot of the businesses downtown, um, for some reason felt that it wasn't for them or that they should be afraid of these people. And so to close and then complain about you lose business every year during the rally, well, then you need to just stay open and you know make some money. They're gonna show if they don't have a rally. They're gonna show no matter what, just to come and see what's going on. It puts Hollister on the map. We have people uh, coming from all over the world. I'm talking other countries. There was people from Japan, Germany. They either shipped their bikes, in a lot of cases by boat, took them two or three months there without their bike to get them to California and then pick them up here as they flew in. Nicest people you want to meet, friendly people. To be honest with you, in 10 years, we never had a major problem. In 11 years, we have never, ever had a problem. It gave this town something to look forward to. I know I do, and I'm not the only one. This town's small, it's growing, but I think we just, uh, we have to have some excitement. I guess the 4th of July is it. The mystique of the American biker is probably one of the most powerful images in all of American society right now. It's a great mystique to have. People love to live it vicariously. I and my brothers love to live it for real. We are carrying on the tradition and the heritage of the original wild ones. The full circle for me, to have a little kid sitting in the living room floor watching that movie on TV, and to be here, you have no idea what an honor it is.